All right. Well, welcome everybody. I'm excited that we're all together again for our second uh, workshop in our leadership workshop series this fall. Um, a couple of just general things before we, we jump into the details. Um, we are recording a video of this so that we can upload it later and share it with those who uh, are interested later or who are unable to make it tonight. Um, something I mentioned last week, but I definitely want to mention again this week, is that uh, those of you in attendance have different roles to fulfill based on your experience with these workshops. Um, some of you have never attended a Husky Robotics Leadership Training Workshop, and welcome. Glad you are here. For some of you, this is your fourth time attending the Leadership Workshop Series, although not necessarily this particular session. Um, so that said, um, the information that uh, Mr. John is going to share with us tonight um, is, is new for most of you, um, and it's a reminder for, for some. Um, keep in mind that when we do have our breakout rooms and then we come back and share out, um, those of you who have been through this Crucial Conversations training before, um, your role is to model the behavior that we're focused on um, and to make room for others to uh, try to do that as well. Um, finally, keep in mind that while our, our session tonight finishes um, at 9.30, um, our leadership training never finishes. Uh, so the, the, the interactions between team members, especially as related to crucial conversations, um, is, is you're practicing that at every Robots After Dark. You're practicing that at every regular season meeting. Um, those are all great places where you can feel safe and develop these skills further together. They take considerable practice. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce Mr. John, who's going to lead us through cru crucial conversations this evening. I'm going to hand it off to him. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Schmidt. So I'm very happy to see so many people here. I'd especially like to welcome any of our guests from outside the team, as well as the new members to our team. Tonight, we are going to talk about the ideas and tools in this book called Crucial Conversations. And why are we doing this? Well, you are all going to spend some time in this life interacting with other people. There will be times when you communicate smoothly with them, and there will be other times when relationships start to go off the rails. In the Husky Robotics team setting, you can't afford to have broken relationships. That is why we want you to have the tools to reopen and maintain honest communication when something has gone wrong. Then you will be able to address the issue and make a bridge port with the other person. Last week, in the Servant Leadership and Team Mindset Training, we introduced the strengths of a team player and noted that one of them was to be compassionate, which means empathy in action. As compassionate people, we recognize the need to do work to help ease the suffering of others. The actions that we are going to talk about in the session are mental and verbal actions to help both the other person and you get the relationship working again so that you can meet your goals. We will focus on the team relationships that each of you have, but you can and should apply these skills to your other relationships as well. So what does compassion have to do with crucial conversations? And what makes a conversation crucial? It's based on when emotions get involved and something important is at stake. Let's take a look at what this looks like. Mr. Schmidt and I are going to get into character now as we act out our first example. Mr. Schmidt is busy oh. letting more people come in. Sorry, go, okay, go ahead. All right, safety glasses on. Oh shoot, I just popped this wire off. Hey, Mr. John. Go get me a Wago screwdriver, will you? All right, go get it yourself, Mr. Schmidt. I have to fix this now. The software team is waiting for it. Why do you think you're more important than me? I'm not more important than you, but this task is on the critical path. And right now you are stopping the team from meeting its goals. 
I was just sitting here doing my job. You came in, broke the robot, and now it's my fault? Yeah, you pea brain dodo bird. It is your fault because you aren't being a team player. Now get the waggo or I'll tell the coach. All right. Raise your hand. If you have experienced a conversation using Zoom, if you've experienced a conversation with similar energy or similar pain, either on or off the team, I'm guessing that at least some of those conversations were with people that you needed to get along with in order to reach your goal. So I see a few hands up. I'm surprised that there aren't more. Oh, okay, well, here they start coming through. Um, it's It can be a lot when you're in the middle of that. And we want to be able to help you guys to find ways around uh, having these conversations. So when it matters most, why are we often at our worst? When we see that something important to us is no longer in reach because of some action or issue, we can develop emotions over that perceived loss. Emotions like fear or anger can quickly come into play. You might notice next that your motives start to change. You had been focused on fixing the robot but now you've shifted your focus to winning the argument that is developing. Emotions like fear or anger might be useful if you're running a race and you want that emotion to help push you to the finish line. But we are not talking about a race where there is only one winner. Instead, we're talking about being in dialogue with another person. We are working towards an outcome that's beneficial to both of us. To improve our chances of making it good for both of us, we need to make sure that we understand the information that both people have. So what tools can get us from a terrible conversation to a good dialogue? These are the three tools that we're going to learn about together. They will help you to both address the problem and respect the person. Begin with the end in mind, learn to look, and make it safe. With any difficult interpersonal situation, it is imperative that you begin with the end in mind. To get both your head and your heart in the right place, ask yourself, what do I really want? What do I really want for them and for myself, for the relationship? What do I not want as a result? Maybe I want them to enjoy their time on the team and I want us to build trust and I don't want to embarrass or hurt them. That seems like a lot of things to make happen all at once. The trick here is to ask the and question. How do I get this and the other thing? How do I talk about this awkward thing and not argue with them? How do I tell them my concerns and not insult them? So Mr. Schmidt is gonna put us into breakout rooms. Please be sure to introduce yourself to anyone you don't already know, and then move on to the questions in the shared document. It'll be these same questions you see on the screen. When we come back, we will share back an answer to each of these questions in the chat. Now remember, uh, this is going to be a five minute breakout room. The counter that you see counting down in your breakout room is going to start at four minutes. And when that counts to zero, you'll see a whole new counter pop up to count down from one minute. Um, and again, when we come back, we'll be sharing our answers in the in the chat. Mr. Schmidt, when you are ready. All right, welcome back everyone. Okay. Well, so uh, as I said, we're going to put responses in the chat. What I would like you to do is if you want to be specific about who you had focused on, you could start your answer with an S for Mr. Schmidt or a J for Mr. John. And go ahead and uh, start putting your, your what, what you would want 
um, if you were that person uh, into the chat and just start filling it up. Yeah, feelings of inclusion are excellent. Yeah, working as a team, wanting to be able to get help. So we've got a lot of teamwork written in many different ways. I really like that. Uh, getting a little bit of time separation in there uh, for people to cool down, that makes sense. We yeah, have finding ways to not escalate the situation. Getting people to feel more valued. All right, a lot of a lot of good. Not winning, making it a team, helping people to understand, uh, you know how how they can be helpful. Um, and respect. So that is that is awesome. Thank you all for your conversations and then for sharing those conversations. All right. So what you really want and don't want out of the conversation is the first part of begin with the end in mind. Now let's look at the second. If you don't talk it out, you will act it out. And way too often, we find ourselves going down an entire path to action. We start with seeing or hearing some observable facts. This is when we should stop progressing down the path to action, but we frequently do not. Next, we tell ourselves a clever story about victims, villains, or helplessness. We'll cover this more in a moment. We should stop our progress on the path here, but often don't. Based on that story, we develop emotions towards the other person, usually with negative implications. This would also be a great place to stop going down the path. But if we don't stop, then we act out those emotions using some mix of verbal silence, like changing the subject, and verbal violence, like yelling and name calling, like Mr. Schmidt did. We will talk more about these in the next tool. Mr. Schmidt, the character, not Mr. Schmidt, the actual person. The end goal is to stop yourself from traveling the path to action. And instead of acting out, you want to get curious about these observed facts. You wanna talk it out and you wanna learn. But let's take a moment to understand these clever stories. These stories are called clever because they allow us to feel good about behaving badly while getting terrible results. Read that again to yourself. So we don't want that to happen. The first kind of story is called the victim story. I am not talking about the victim of a crime. What I am talking about is telling yourself a story where you were beyond perfect and still this horrible thing happened to you can you believe it? So in the example, Mr. John had no personal accountability for the problem. So he did not see where he needed to apologize nor where he needed to make changes in his own behavior to meet the common goal. Next, we'll look at the villain story. The other person is the villain in your mind. So that means you're fighting evil. And when you're fighting evil, your mind justifies using any means to win. Like the argument earlier where Mr. Schmidt's motives shifted to winning. If this was you, you might stereotype the other person or label them with, with a nickname like pea brain dodo bird. You would likely do things that you would not be proud of in the future. 
if you will ever get past this villain story. Those around you would likely note that you were the one that destroyed the relationship. Now, a helpless story often comes from a villain story. The other person is a villain and will not change no matter what you do. You may move to verbal silence and not address the issue at all by avoiding, or you may move to verbal violence and take out your anger on the other person. You know it won't do any good, hey, yelling and name calling might make you feel better, right? So don't think of the helpless story as the person who's helpless as being incapable of taking any action. Instead, think of the helpless story as giving you the license to not care anymore. So in the handout, you have the script from Mr. Schmidt and Mr. John's conversation that turned crucial. Pretend that you as a group were one of the two characters. When you're in the breakout room, you're given a breakout room number. So even numbered teams get Mr. Schmidt and odd numbered teams get Mr. John. Start with their observed facts from this interaction. Then see if you can figure out what story they each told themselves and work your way to understand their feelings, ending with their final verbal actions. Do you think this all happened because of the Wago incident? So we want to hear just a, a few groups when we come back. We will not have time, I'm sorry, uh, to hear from everyone. So please pick someone to report out from your group. Um, and then remember, even numbered teams are doing the perspective of Mr. Schmidt and odd numbered teams get Mr. John. And again, look for the script in your handout. Go ahead, Mr. Schmidt. There we go. All right, welcome back everyone. All right. So uh, uh, if you did Mr. Schmidt's perspective, um, if you could, and you are the reporter outer, uh, raise your hand, I'll take one or two of you guys. Okay, Amar. Um, yeah, so our group talked about, for the first part, uh, Mr. Schmidt kind of observed uh, Mr. John's reaction to his, like, asking of him to go get the Wago screwdriver. And then um, we said that Mr. Schmidt played the villain card after when he said, like, um... We said, like, you are stopping the team from meeting its goals. And we said that Mr. Schmidt expressed uh, anger uh, in, like, his last line when he said, like, uh, it's not, or it is your fault because you're not being a team player. Like, that kind of shows anger. And then we also said, the last part, we said Mr. Schmidt showed violence at the end rather than silence. Yep. Very good. Very good. Simi, do you have anything uh, different to add to that? Um, I also had Mr. Schmidt, and um, I guess Mr. Schmidt kind of was in a very, the facts were that he was in a very much of a hurry, trying to do something at the last second, and just said to the nearest person in a very hurried manner to get the screwdriver for them. Um, probably not in the best way possible, but they did ask. And then in that moment, definitely was trying, kind of being the villain, but in the moment probably felt like they were the victim and then jumped to feeling angry and then decided to escalate the situation and chose violence. Absolutely. All right, thank you. Um, next, a uh, couple of hands for uh, Mr. John's perspective. Wants to report out on that. Tyler, go ahead. All right, so what we first observed was that Mr. John kind of started uh, like, took offense to Mr. Schmidt's first line. And then that started to escalate on his second line by pulling the victim story on Mr. Schmidt. Um, and that made Mr. Schmidt pretty angry. And then Mr. John uh, started getting angry and upset and also hurt. Um, 
and then he pulled the full victim story. And then after that, it was just <laughs> uh, Mr. Schmidt threatening him. Yeah, yeah. It's a whole lot of unhappiness in that conversation. All right, thank you, Tyler. Declan, do you have anything to, to add to that? Yeah, I think uh, Mr. John definitely took what Mr. Schmidt said in a way that how it probably wasn't intended because Mr. Schmidt said in a very hurried way. And so he told himself the victim story of like, I didn't break this. Why is he being rude to me? And I think he felt disrespected because the way Mr. Schmidt said it was, it just seemed very disrespectful. And then he acted by kind of escalating the situation and not um, like trying to talk it out or explain why he felt disrespected. Yeah, yeah. All right, very good, very good. Well, thank you. Thank you all. All right, um, this is the end of the begin with the end in mind tool. So let's take a look now at the second tool. It's called learn to look. You want to recognize if a conversation turns crucial, when the emotions of one or both of you start ramping up. Remember verbal silence and verbal violence are the action that we take after we have told a clever story and had an emotional response to it. So when actions get observed, then you know you are in a crucial conversation. On the screen, you can see the major categories of verbal silence and verbal violence and some keywords to help explain them, such as avoiding and withdrawing, controlling and attacking. So at the beginning of the presentation, uh, Mr. Schmidt and I were asking you to be ready with your answers to the style under stress questions in the pre-work. What I'd like you to do now is take a look at only the questions that you answered as true. Which column do they mainly fall under? So for example, a person might have answered true to questions one, four, five, nine, and 10, and you could say that they favor silence as a style, right? Um, but if they're more evenly split, then maybe you're gonna say that they're balanced in their style usage. Please note that this is only a style that you use. It is not an inalterable character trait or a genetic predisposition. You can learn to change your behavior away from using these styles and instead always begin with the end in mind, learn to look and make it safe. So hopefully you now know which column you fit into for or verbal violence. When you are in a conversation, you want to recognize when it turns crucial, when the emotions of one or both of you start ramping up. And here we can see some of these deeper examples of verbal silence or verbal violence. We have for silence, it's masking and avoiding, like talking without addressing the real issues or withdrawing physically leaving the conversation. I should have, let me go back to masking. That's like the sugar coating and sarcasm and, and couching your phrases. Um, and in violence, it's all up there, the controlling, labeling, attacking. In your handout on this slide, uh, please click on that link. What is your style under stress? and that will help us to build a word cloud. Type in your current style under stress, silence, violence, or balanced. And then one additional word that describes one aspect of your style, style under stress, such as masking or controlling. And Mr. Schmidt, are you ready for me to stop share? I am. All right. So, We'll get to see this in real time. A whole bunch of people that were silenced just went in. Now a whole bunch of people have balanced. Yep. 
And don't forget to throw in that second word as well uh, that, des that describes something that uh, maybe you do more frequently in your style. This is almost like waiting for, you know, all the votes to come in on, on election day. Where is it going to end up? So I think this is the third year in a row that we have had much more silence than violence. Um, please recognize that neither one of those is good. Uh, they can both be just as damaging. Uh, it's just one is a little bit more loud and obvious to onlookers than the other. All right. Well, I'll start sharing the screen again. So When you, when you look at all those different ways that people on your team respond when they're under stress, it helps you to understand your, both you and your teammates better. Recognizing that most of you who go to silence or are balanced will help you to be more aware of what the style under stress looks like. And then more of you can watch for it appearing in the conversation. Now, I don't want you to just say, hey, you're using avoidance and sarcasm. You must be using your verbal violence under stress, your verbal silence style under stress. Uh, what I do mean is this works great. You, when you're working with another person, you have to address them with compassion, right? Empathy and action. If you, if you catch somebody and you start calling out what they're doing. You can't do it in such a way that's going to add fuel to the fire and escalate the problem. All right. So let's say that you have now recognized that you or the other person or both are moving to verbal silence or verbal violence. Now is the time to step out of the conversation and work on making it safe again. You want it to be safe for both of you to be able to share your observations so that you can understand what the true issues are and get to work addressing those. The first three skills that we will learn for make it safe are apologize when appropriate. If you have the sudden realization that for sure I really said that, then you need to apologize. The next one is to contrast to improve understanding. We'll get to some examples in a minute. And the third one is retracing your path. If you have moved to verbal violence or verbal silence, how did you get there? You want to work your way back to the observable facts. And then you will have to repeat. We are only human. We will make mistakes, as we noted in the servant leadership training last week. Your conversation will not go perfectly, but nine out of 10 times you can build the relationship if you do the compassionate work to make it safe. You will likely have to apologize, contrast, and retrace more than once. So when I'm talking about apologizing, I mean you have to apologize from the heart, recognizing your role in the problem. I don't mean these things that are over here on the left. I'm sorry if you feel that way. The column on the left is sometimes called fake apologies. You have to be sincere in your apologies or the other person will see right through you and the trust that you are working to build will be destroyed. The next skill is contrasting. I've been contrasting throughout this whole presentation. 
sometimes you say something that is not exactly obvious. So now you need to contrast to clarify it. You will need to say something like, I do not mean this. I do mean that to help the other person understand your true intent. And the third skill in the Make It Safe toolbox is retracing your path. This is similar to the breakout room that we did earlier, where you traced how Mr. Schmidt or I started on the path and how we got to the end. Retracing your path is different because this is a tool to help you when you're in the middle of a conversation that is turning crucial. So we already talked about learning to look to see if the conversation is going wrong. If you can see it's going wrong and they're the one reacting to you, then you must be acting out. So if I'm acting out, what are these feelings that I'm feeling? And why do I have them? What story did I tell myself? And finally, why did I tell this story? What were the facts that I originally observed? I've now moved backwards from act to feel, to tell a story, to see and hear, and I've finally gotten back to the facts that I observed. Now I can recognize that there are other facts out there too, and I can get curious about what those other facts are. So here are the first three skills again in Make It Safe. Apologizing when appropriate, using contrasting to improve understanding, and retracing your path. And then remembering to repeat, because we will all make mistakes and will then need to fix them. So now we're gonna go back to the scene of the crucial conversation, where we find our FRC players trying to fix relationship concerns. To set the stage, Mr. John is doing some work and Mr. Schmidt, who has been doing some thinking, comes over. Hey, Mr. John, I would like to apologize for what happened earlier and, and try to get a better understanding. Do you have some time now? Sure, whatever. I realized that I told myself a clever story earlier and I let myself get emotional. I apologize for calling you names and threatening to report you to the coaches. I was wrong and I should not have lost my temper. I am sorry. Yeah. You weren't being a team player. After that incident, I realized that there may be something more broken in our relationship than just that one wago issue. I would like to see if we could work on making things better between us. Are you open to that? No, nah, look, we're good. You say we are good, but your actions seem to be telling me that we are not. I would really like to understand what is going on and help to make it better. Ever since you became the lead, you've been really bossy and you don't care about any of my ideas. You believe that I think that I am better than you? Is that correct? Yeah, like when you shot down my idea on how to fix the pneumatics in the middle of the team meeting yesterday. I thought we used to be friends. Mr. John, now that you mention it, I realize that I did shoot you down yesterday. I apologize for doing that. It was not appropriate. I do want to be a good team lead and I do not want to hurt our friendship. I am focused so much on how to be a good team lead that I forget how I impact the people around me. Can you please help me find a way to be a good team lead and rebuild our friendship? All right. Okay, I'm out of character again. In your small groups, please analyze this conversation. Once again, it's in your handouts. How did Mr. Schmidt work to repair the relationship? What tools did he use? Remember, we gave you handouts that include the script. We'll have a few groups report out. So choose a speaker for your group. If you have already reported out previously, please let someone else do it. All right, we are ready for the breakout rooms.
There we go. All right, welcome back, everyone. All right. So we have just a couple of minutes for reporting out, and I'd like to hear from two or three groups. Again, if you've already reported out previously, please let someone else go. Um, so uh, raise your hands in Zoom if you'd like to. Hey, there's Jake. All right, Jake, go ahead. Um, so our group realized that like in the beginning, Mr. Schmidt like um, at least talks about how he'd like to apologize. Um, and then he goes into it more about like apologizing about like um, the way he reacted and that kind of, uh, and like uh, apologizes for like calling names and threatening to report him to the coaches. Um, and then we saw that like towards the end, he like contrasts where it's like talking about how he says, um, like, I do want to be a good team lead um, and I don't want to hurt our friendship. So just kind of like reiterating like what his, his goals are and how um, there could be some like misunderstanding there. Um, and then he retraces prior to that, he kind of talks about how um, he, uh, he kind of retraces and, uh, like at, phrases the question of, um, like, you believe that you think I, uh, you believe that I think I am better than you. Is that correct? And so that kind of poses the question to Mr. John, which then, uh, is like saying, okay, so you think this, like it gives it so that way Mr. John's able to express like his frustrations or his feelings about it. So that way they're able to like talk about what each of them are feeling. All right. All right. Thank you very much for sharing, Jake. Lodum. Yeah. Um, so retracing your path in the end, um, Mr. Schmidt and Mr. John were both working together to try to pinpoint the root of why they're um, disagreement started and the cause of Mr. Schmidt being uh, bossy um, and shooting down ideas that Mr. John had. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Lou. Helena. Yeah, similar to what everybody else said, um, I think the earnest apology was really good. And the fact that Mr. Schmidt was patient with Mr. John rather than kind of trying to get the apology over with and letting, giving him time to kind of earn trust again and open up because like he would keep asking whether he wanted to like share more because he probably knew that there was something else there. Um, it didn't just accept his dismissiveness and turn another crucial conversation sour. Very good. Thank you. And Ben. Uh, we said that he apologized for his actions, like his earlier actions. Um, when he, when Mr. John said, um, no, look, we're good. Um, he read between the lines, also saw his body language. And so he decided that um, Mr. John wasn't like, he didn't fully feel like it was okay. So they talked more about it. And then Mr. Schmidt got some constructive criticism and then acted upon it and asked more about it. And now he's trying to fix his problems. Very good. Thank you, Ben. I, I do want to take just a quick moment to clarify. Um, when you're retracing your path, you're, you're, you're not looking for why are the two of you arguing? You are looking for what story did you tell after you saw or heard these observable facts? And, and that's critical because um, while that is part of the argument, another part of the argument is their story that they told themselves at some point in time along the path to, to both of you having a problem. Um, so there's, there's a lot of information out there in the, in the larger three-day training that is Crucial Conversations in corporate America. Uh, they talk more about uh, expanding the pool of knowledge 
and you want to get curious so that you can learn what the other person is thinking, what they, why, you know, why they got to where they did, which is exactly what you guys started to talk about, uh, some of you at, at the end there, um, that, that they, uh, Mr. John and Mr. Schmidt were, we're having that conversation, trying to work back to, okay, what is our, our root cause of, of the issue? But it's, that's through expanding the, expanding the pool of knowledge. Uh, retracing your path is really very much focused on yourself. All right, let's move along to make it safe. There will be times when you are doing the compassionate hard work to make it safe and the other person is still stuck in silence or violence. Take a moment to look at the script in the handout and recognize when these other key words came into play. Uh, ask, mirror, and paraphrase were all used. Suggest was not used by Mr. Schmidt, but he used the other three. As part of making it safe, it also helps to resist interrupting and value everyone's truth. So in your handout, we've also provided a number of examples uh, that I'd like you to, to take a look at and also to remember that you can go back and look at these if you're ever preparing for a crucial conversation where you know that you're walking into something that's going to be difficult and you want to have some phrases ready such as please let me know if you see it differently you say you're okay but from the tone of your voice you seem upset uh the paraphrase that's that's all a big huge chunk i'd like to check my understanding i think that and then you explain what you think and then you say did I understand that correctly? And you're, you're asking at the end of that paraphrase. Uh, so that's actually going back to the very top one, right? And suggesting. Suggesting works well when they are not sharing anything, when they are in silence, but you have to do it very tentatively. Are you thinking that I pulled you off that project because I thought you couldn't do it? right you're making assumptions and you're saying the assumptions out loud trying to help the other person to become part of the conversation so we have the beginning of a crucial conversation here where one person has seemingly prepared for this. They're the ones on the left indent. The ones on the right indent are the people who maybe didn't prepare for it. And you can use this again to, you can come back to this kind of thing and talk through uh, to, to help you to prepare for how you're going to talk through this conversation. You'll notice in that first statement, you're bringing up the facts, you're using contrasting, and you're being tentative. You're asking a question at the end of it. That helps to set the stage for the other person to be a little bit more open. They aren't necessarily going to be more open. But then how do you get past that? Well, you go back and you use some more contrasting, you use some more, try to develop a mutual purpose, and again, you're tentative. You always end with being tentative. Is, is this what you want? Is, is this how you see it? Um, how, how else could we, could we think about this? Right, and, and you're, what you're trying to do is help them to see that you are not above them. You are not the boss of them. Um, you respect them and you are trying to hand them this gift of, of um, respectfulness and and ownership of the problem that you know the two of you own it together you really need their input to understand the full uh, 
the full complement of this problem. All right. You have now heard some of the most powerful tools in the Crucial Conversations book. You know enough to start planning and holding crucial conversations of your own. You begin with the end in mind, you learn to look, and you make it safe. So putting everything together, we want you to think about how you could address these issues. So you have these questions on your, on your handouts. You have uh, the slide with a simple list of all the tools. Might be two slides, don't remember. And uh, we'll go into breakout rooms again, choose somebody to report out, and uh, just pick a scenario, maybe get into more than one scenario. Um, but you're going to have some additional time for this one. Uh, Mr. Schmidt, if I remember correctly, this was a 10 minute breakout room. Sounds and, good. And so uh, really dig into how you could put those tools together uh, to improve what has just happened in, in these three, in one or two of these three different uh, problems here. All right, when you're ready, Mr. Schmidt. All right, see everybody in a bit. All right, welcome back, everyone. All right, cool. So uh, once again, we'd like to, to hear a few people report out. Um, and again, uh, hopefully people who have not uh, reported out previously, raise your hand in the chat and we'll get started. All right, Aaron, tell us which, which one you did uh, and then what you, what you came up with. Um, we looked at number three, the mm -hmm. why are you trying to undermine my authority question, which we immediately said that there is something needed in learn to look because there is clearly some sort of larger misunderstanding here. Something is being seen as one thing by one person and something completely different by someone else. And the stories need to be identified to figure out what exactly that is. Beyond that, making it safe seems pretty crucial here, given that the person who started the conversation is already being incredibly accusatory. And that probably needs to be toned back a little bit for the sake of the conversation. Excellent. Finally, as far as the begin with the end in mind, the ultimate goal here is not to make anyone feel like they have severely messed up, but more so to clarify a point, which plays into the other two. Okay. Okay. Very good. Very good. Thank you for sharing, Aaron. All right. Ayush. Yeah. So uh, we talked about the first situation about the top priority. And then um, we kind of talked about, um, I think like one tool that we said was like the learn to look and you can kind of see that like this person kind of, I guess, was surprised that about kind of being assigned to this task and having to do this. And we kind of said like the learn to look would kind of be useful here, like understanding that they're surprised and maybe having them like understand like kind of why this is important maybe and like the importance of them being assigned to a certain task. Um, and also like uh, part of like the make it safe tool, just un uh, having them also understand that there's also other people that are here to help you. Um, they're not like solely responsible for this. Like there's also other resources and other people here to help you and make make sure that if you need any help that you get that help. Very good, very good. All right, did anybody do number two, the, the dead feature? All right, check. Yeah, so me and my group were talking about the second one and that we really wanted to make it safe for the person who was feeling probably like it was their fault that they didn't know, or maybe that, that it was somebody else's fault that they didn't know, but it's really okay that they miss things. People make mistakes and it's, we want to make it safe. So they're not really focused on that. They made that mistake, but that we can think about the end in mind or begin with the end in mind about the learning from what that mistake is and really not focus on the bad focus on 
what good we could get out of it. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, I, I might add to that uh, a, a little bit of apologizing, right? Um, I'm sorry that your time and effort were wasted. Uh, can we take a look at where we can put your skills to best use? Maybe something like that. Um, Mr. Mingle. I, I was going to say the, the other thing that came to my mind about that second point was um, you're, you're asking a question which is actually pretty much rhetorical, right? You don't actually want to know why they're working on it. You want to tell them <laughs> that they shouldn't still be working on it. So, but the second part is, if you thought about that question for even a second, you would realize that you know the answer. The only reason they would be working on a feature that was canceled is because they weren't aware that it was canceled, right? I mean, so anyway, that was... Yeah. Um, if you, if you sort of catch yourself asking a rhetorical question like that, you're kind of starting down a bad road. Very good, very good, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so now I'd like, to, I'd like to bring this into some reality and also hopefully reassure you a little bit. These are hard tools to remember to use while you are in the middle of a conversation. You may be able to retrace your path right there in the middle of the conversation. And other times you don't realize what has happened until later. And you have to go back and fix it like Mr. Schmidt did in our example. Sometimes you have to wait until later because you need space and time for emotions to subside. Somebody said that in the chat earlier. So it is hard to do this well. I have problems doing this well, but if each of us keeps trying, remember that repeat part that we said? If you do that repeat part, you keep trying, we will get better. You can improve your relationships after a conversation turned crucial by repeating, going through the asking, mirror, paraphrasing, making it safe, learning to look, beginning with the end in mind. You will have better communication throughout your entire team if you continue to put this into practice. Now, something big that your team has going for it is that all of you now have gone through this training, some of you three times. This gives you a common language and common cues so that hopefully if you hear someone using these skills with you, you'll be able to recognize that the conversation has turned crucial and that you need to pause and help to rebuild that relationship. So now that you understand what a crucial conversation is, please take a moment for introspection. Do you have any places in your life that aren't going well? Do you have any relationships that feel stuck because you can't get past something that was said or that was done in the past? Or maybe you've played out scenarios in your head and they all end up with you and the other person in verbal silence or verbal violence. And so you don't want to, to try to un, unpack that. So if you have relationships like that, that are stuck, think through why you feel that way. Retrace your path to action. Are you attributing evil intent to the other person? What story are you telling yourself? A victim, villain, maybe a helpless story? Remember, our truth really enables a change of heart. 
but we have to share that truth. There are more skills for crucial conversations that I would love to teach you. As I told you before, this is a two and a half or three day training in corporate America. Really hard to boil that down to an hour and a half here. There are even skills for how to respectfully hold other people accountable, which we will be discussing next week, uh, the next week. If you ever get the chance, pick up these books or take the professional training because they are both awesome. Now also the resources that were in the slides, those are in Trello with the slides on, the, on a card in Trello to help you to be able to find your way through a crucial conversation in the future. For those of you who like silly acronyms, here's a list of them. And to take a moment to talk about what's coming up, crucial accountability is not next week because next week is Halloween and we thought that people might like to spend time doing something else. Um, but crucial accountability is November 7th. And then you see that we'll be getting into project management and failure mode analysis, the vision and goal setting, and then a captain led development of vision and success instruments. We would like of as many of you as have interest and time to come to these next leadership workshops. And now finally, We would like you to go back into your handout on the last slide is this link to the Keep Fix Try document. The last time we looked, the only person who had written anything was Mr. John, this guy. And he wrote something about how uh, to, to fix or to try was um, trying to see if the if the adults could figure out how to use Zoom technology better for this one than in the servant leadership one where we had lots of problems. Uh, there are, there's breakouts for keep fix tries for each of the different uh, trainings that we'll be having. We would love to hear your feedback in those keep fix tries. So please take a moment, click the button or click the link and just type into that document uh, so that we get a feeling for what's important to you, uh, what's not important to you, what else you might want to see different. So that is it for the evening. We are two minutes early almost. Thank you all very much for coming. And uh, while uh, whenever, whenever you see me or many other adults, um, if you want to talk about crucial conversations, let us know. Uh, if something isn't going quite right with a relationship with somebody else, many of us would be happy to sit down and talk to you. And if not, they'll be happy to say, oh, go and talk to Mr. John. And be happy to, to help you plan out that crucial conversation that you need to have with somebody. All right, with that, uh, do the keep fix try and we can sign off. Thank you all very much once again. Thank you so much, Mr. John. That was amazing.